Carter, master detective. Yes, it's a case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, master detective. <laughs> Continuing the curious adventure called The House of Death or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Grave. Jonathan Drake, an eccentric millionaire, tells Nick Carter that his brother Philip Drake is trying to prove him insane so he can get control of the Drake fortune. Nick finds evidence to support Jonathan's story and agrees to protect Jonathan against Philip in spite of Philip's warning that Jonathan really is crazy. Spending the night at the Drake Mansion, Nick and Scubby are wakened in the middle of the night by Jonathan, who is wandering through the halls calling for someone named Louise. And when they try to quiet him, he draws a gun and threatens to kill them. You're keeping her from me! You've taken Louise away! I'm going to kill you! <laughs> <laughs> All right, Scubby, quick. Oh, Pick no. up his gun. I'll take care of the old man. All right, Nick. Louise. Are you all right, Mr. Drake? Louise. Nick, don't. he doesn't even hear you. Say, he must be nuts after all. Yeah, let's take him back to his room, Scubby. I'll give him a sedative. He should be asleep in a few minutes. Yes, Scubby. He's sleeping like a baby at last. If you hadn't kicked your slipper at him, we might have been dead pigeons. Well, he never even recognized us. Just kept talking about Louise. I wonder who she could be. His wife, Scubby. I saw a painting of her downstairs in the library with her name inscribed on it. What do you say we go down and have a look at it? Oh, that suits me, Nick. I don't feel sleepy anymore. All right, come on. Gosh, Nick. You know, for a while I thought Philip was trying to railroad Jonathan in, into an insane asylum. Now it looks as though Jonathan is crazy. I wonder, Scubby. Jonathan seemed perfectly sane earlier this evening. He seemed to be telling the truth. Oh, but gosh, Nick, you yourself have told me plenty of times that insane people can act perfectly normal for long periods of time and then will suddenly go haywire. Maybe that's what Jonathan did. Could be, Scubby, but... I... Hey, Nick, someone's unlocking the front door. Why, we'll see who it is. I thought Jonathan lived here alone. He does, Scubby, except for... Oh, Nick, it's Hawkins. Oh, good evening, Mr. Carter. Perhaps I should say good morning. Uh, good morning. Tell me, Hawkins, is Mr. Drake in the habit of prowling around the house late at night? Oh, did you find Mr. Drake wandering through the house looking for his wife, Louise? Yes. Is that a habit of his? He does that now and again, sir, but he's perfectly harmless. Sir, yeah. that's what you think. Would you say that Mr. Drake is insane, Hawkins? Oh, no, sir. Except for such occasions as this, he's just as sane as you or I. Hmm. Tell me, Hawkins. Have you ever seen a coffin in Mr. Drake's room? Oh, yes, sir. It's been there for years. Mr. Drake sleeps in it every night. He says he feels that when he's in his coffin, he's closer to his dear departed wife. But, Nick, you said Quiet, that... Scully. Thank you, Hawkins. Uh, will there be anything else, sir? No, Hawkins, that's all. Very good, sir. Good night. Good night, gentlemen. Hey, I don't get it, Nick. Just a little while ago, you told me the coffin had been placed in Jonathan's bedroom recently. But Hawkins says it's been there for years. He's lying, Scabby. The fresh scratches on the coffin and on the doorway to Jonathan's room proves it. But, Nick, why should Hawkins lie about it? Hawkins is obviously working with Philip and not with Jonathan. But, Nick, Hawkins wasn't lying about Jonathan prowling around the house at night. We saw that for ourselves. Yes, Scabby, and that's the strange thing about this case. If Philip knows that his brother Jonathan has these irrational moments, why bother to place a coffin in his bedroom? Well, maybe he's just trying to build up a stronger case against Jonathan. Perhaps, Scabby. But I think there's some other reason, and I'm determined to find out what it is. Well, good morning, Nick. Oh, hello, Scubby. You get up, finally. Well, you shouldn't have let me sleep so late, Nick. Hey, what are you doing here in the library? Oh, I was looking at Jonathan Drake's books. He has quite a collection of books on chess. Must be very fond of it. Well, you ought to challenge him to a game, Nick. Maybe I... Yeah. Oh. Hey, what's that you're looking at, Nick? Blotter, Scabby. Has writing on it. Yeah? Can you make it out? Wait till I hold it up to this mirror. Well, let's see. May 2nd, 1944. I, Jonathan Drake, being of sound... It's hmm, all I can make out. Well, sounds like the beginning of a will, Nick. Yes, Scabby. I should say that Mr. Drake drew up a new will on May 2nd. That's just a week ago. 
Probably got tired of Philip's attempt to get control of the estate and cut him off without a cent. Good morning, gentlemen. Oh, good morning, Mr. Drake. Oh, good morning, sir. I trust you slept well. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Drake, if I'm not being too personal, would you mind telling me who the heirs to your estate are? Uh, my heirs? Yes. Well, my sister Hester and my brother Philip will share equally in my estate. You mean you're leaving Philip half of everything in spite of what he's trying to do to you? Uh, well, you see, my will was drawn up before Philip started proceedings against me. And I never changed it. Yeah, but what about the will you wrote? Uh, Mr. Drake, I um, I see that you have quite a collection of books on chess. You must be very fond of the game. Uh, oh, yes, yes, I am. Well, I, too, am quite fond of it. it offers so many intricate moves. Yes, it does. Uh, tell me, Mr. Drake, when you play chess, do you find you get better results when you move the knight horizontally across the board or when you move him vertically? Uh, horizontally, Mr. Carter. But, Nick, a knight Yes, I w- quite agree with you, Mr. Drake. We must have a game sometime. Why, uh, why yes, of course, Mr. Carter. I'm afraid, though, my assistant and I will have to leave you for a few hours, though. We uh, hadn't anticipated staying here in your home, and, of course, we'll need a change of clothes. Uh, very well. Uh, but you will return as soon as possible, won't you? Oh, yes, of course. You can expect us back early this evening. Oh, yes, Patsy. Hiya, Patsy. Oh, hello there, Scabby. Oh, Patsy, were you able to find out who Jonathan Drake's attorney is? Yes, Nick. His name is Richard Morgan. He has an office in the Fairfield building. Good. Will you make an appointment for me to see him this afternoon? Yes, I'll do that, Nick. I'll be back in just a minute. Say, what do you want to see this Morgan guy for, Nick? As Jonathan Drake's lawyer, Scabby, he may be able to clear up a few things for me. Yeah, well, I hope so. This case gets screwier and screwier. Sure has some queer angles to it. Yes, you're right about that, Scabby. And that's one reason I took it. But it isn't working out at all the way I thought it would. No? Well, what do you mean, Nick? Well, first of all, Scubby, there's the matter of the coffin. Now, we know that Philip and Hawkins were lying when they said that Jonathan had been sleeping in it for years. Sure, Nick. The scratches ought to prove that. Therefore, it's obvious Philip and Hawkins are trying to put something over on Jonathan. But then again, Jonathan's prowling through the house in his attempt to kill us would seem to prove his insanity without anything else. Now, if Hawkins is, uh, rather, if Jonathan is crazy... Why should Philip go to all the trouble of planting a coffin in his bedroom to prove it? Gosh, Nick, it it doesn't make sense, does it? No, Scubby, it doesn't. And that's what puzzles me. And this morning in the library, I found a clue that changes everything. Well, what was that, Nick? You recall the blotter, Scubby? The writing on it? Sure, Nick. You mean Drake's new will. Exactly. Jonathan Drake obviously made out a new will on May 2nd, one week ago. Yet when I asked him about his will, he told us he had made it out before Philip started proceedings. It was a month ago. Oh, gosh, Nick. How could a guy forget a will he drew up only a week ago? Scubby, perhaps he never did draw it up. But, Nick, we saw it on the blotter. Perhaps Jonathan Drake we talked to was not the Jonathan Drake who drew up the will. Oh, Nick, don't tell me you think there are two of them. Yes, Scubby. It's possible that the Jonathan Drake we know is not the real Jonathan Drake. Nick, you mean he's a phony? Yes, Scubby, I do. I was suspicious of him when he denied any knowledge of the will. So to satisfy myself, I tested his knowledge of chess. Yeah, and he didn't know the first thing about the game. (laughs) Didn't even know how a knight should move. That made me certain he was an imposter. For the real Jonathan Drake does know chess. But, Nick, if the guy we know is a phony, where's the real Jonathan Drake? Unless I'm very much mistaken, Scubby, he's dead. Dead? Yes, and the man who's impersonating him is part of Philip Drake's plot to gain control of his brother's millions. Gosh, Nick, how do you figure that? Scubby, it's plain as can be. Philip Drake is a playboy who lives far beyond his means. And as long as his brother Jonathan was alive, there was no way he could get more money out of him. Oh, so he had to figure out some way to get rid of his brother without letting anyone know. Exactly, Scubby. I see. The fact that the real Jonathan Drake was a recluse was all in Philip's favor. There were only three people living who knew the real Jonathan. Hawkins, Hester Drake, and Philip himself. You're right, Nick. So Philip's first step was to bribe Hawkins to assist him. His second step was to kill Jonathan and to substitute someone to impersonate him. But, Nick, why would Philip want to have this phony Jonathan declared insane? Scubby, don't you see? With the phony Jonathan out of the way, Philip will gain gain control of the fortune. And yet to the world, Jonathan Drake will still be alive. Oh, sure, I see it now. But, Nick, why did Philip have the phony Jonathan call us into the case? Ah, that's where Philip overplayed his hand, Scubby. I think he wanted a prominent witness like myself to testify that the phony Jonathan really was insane. You mean, Nick, that he was playing you for a sucker? Exactly. Well, gosh, Nick, what a dope he was. He might have gotten away with it, too, if he hadn't called you into the case. Quite right, Scully. But now that I've guessed the truth, we're going to prove it step by step. 
All right. What's our next move, Nick? We're going to pay a call on Richard Morgan, attorney for Jonathan Drake, and see what he knows. <laughs> Morgan? Yes? I'm Nick Carter, and this is my assistant, Scubby Wilson. How do you do, gentlemen? How do you do? Won't you be seated? Thank you. Mr. Morgan, I understand you're to represent your client, Mr. Jonathan Drake, at his sanity hearing. Yes, although I'm in a rather difficult position, as I can hardly defend a client who refuses to see me. Oh, you've never met Mr. Drake? No, I haven't. My father occasionally saw Mr. Drake at his home, but since he died, Mr. Drake has transacted all his business with me over the phone. I see. Mr. Morgan, I have reason to believe that Jonathan Drake drew up a new will on May 2nd of this year. you know anything about it? Yes, but I'm surprised that you know about it. Do you have that will? Yes, I have. It was delivered to me on the morning of May 3rd by a Mr. George Ross. I believe he's an air raid warden in Mr. Drake's neighborhood. He received it under the most peculiar circumstances. Was there a letter with the will? Yes, the letter was very brief. It said that Mr. Drake was in great danger, that he was sending me a new will which was only to be opened upon his death. There was also a sealed letter to his sister Hester in California, which I was to mail. I see. And you did as he asked? Naturally. Mm -hmm. But I was quite worried by the tone of his letter, so I phoned him at his home to find out what the danger was that he was in. What did he say? He was very brusque. He said there was absolutely nothing wrong. There was no need for me to concern myself. Then he hung up. I see. Mr. Morgan, would it be possible for me to see the will that Mr. Drake sent you a week ago? I'm afraid, Mr. Carter, that's out of the question. I must respect my client's instructions. Well, I know my request is an unusual one, Mr. Morgan, but it's extremely important that I see the will. I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, but I must refuse your request, just as I refused a similar one this morning. You mean someone else knows about the will and asked to see it? Yes, his sister, Hester Drake. Hester Drake is here in town? Yes, she arrived from California this morning. She's staying at the Edgewood Hotel. Come on, Scubby. There isn't a minute to waste. Why? What's wrong, Nick? If we don't get to Hester Drake before it's too late, her life is in danger. <laughs> For some reason known only to himself, Nick seems to believe that Hester Drake is in great danger. But what danger can it be that threatens Hester's life? And will Nick be able to save her? Listen tomorrow. Don't miss the special appearance of Nick Carter as guest detective on Johnny Morgan's program, Showtime, at 10.30 tonight over another network. The Strange Adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, features Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Patsy is played by Helen Choate. The stories are written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, and original music is played by Lew White. The entire production is under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs> night at the same time, listen to the further adventures of Nick Carter in the case entitled The House of Death, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Grave. <laughs> the adventures of Nick's adopted son, Chick Carter, boy detective, are broadcast over most of these stations Monday through Friday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. Nick's own show, The Return of Nick Carter, a copyright feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated, is presented by the Mutual Broadcasting System from our New York studios and is broadcast over most of these stations every evening, Monday through Friday, at a quarter past nine, Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. <laughs>